Two year lights. Um, those lights actually can talk with the alternative firmware uh, via MQTT. And we can use this uh, to our advantage. And uh, I will uh, go into that a little bit in this talk and uh, see how we can uh, build on this. Um, my name is Crazier. Um, some people call me as uh, AT or know me just as A because they're lazy, probably. Um, I've been tinkering for years with different stuff. Um, normal uh, day job involves uh, industrial control systems, so uh, it's a bit away from this, but still technical. Um, some people might know me from the Angry Nerds podcast, and uh, I want to preface, I am not an expert on these subjects, but I think they're awesome, and that's why I want to share them with you today. Um, we're going to see uh, a build-up of three um, building blocks to create our uh, entire system, and the first one will be MQTT itself. Uh, I mean, we've probably seen the term, but what does it stand for? It stands for nothing anymore. Originally, it was uh, called MQ tele Telemetry Transport uh, when it was first developed by IBM. Um, now it's just the four letters and uh, used like that. It's a publish and subscribe network transport mechanism. It shouldn't be called a protocol. I was corrected uh, uh, just after I finished the slide. So there, there is some protocol reference in there. It's a, a transport and not a protocol per se, as it, it's um, unaware of uh, the data it is carrying. Um, it's a, a system where you have one broker, one central server where everything connects to just using one simple TCP IP port. So on a network, it's very easy to route and uh, firewall. There are authentication and SSL support uh, uh, options, uh, but I'm not using it in this demo because that would be too uh, complicated and convoluted for uh, this short time. Um, like I said, it was developed uh, by IBM and um, development started in 1999. It was an internal development uh, for use uh, in uh, pipelines to communicate uh, all the status information along the pipeline. It had to be lightweight. It had to use very little power, very little CPU power and bandwidth, uh, but it had to have some guarantees for data delivery. And uh, there is a QoS uh, built in, uh, in three levels will we come, through, uh, come to later. And um, in 2010, which is uh, uh, quite a while after its initial release, um, version 3.1 was released uh, royalty-free to the public. And uh, that was when uh, we first uh, were introduced to it. And uh, it has slowly uh, been, uh, well, uh, it, it became part of the standard IoT and home automation suite, I think. Um, in 2014, we had a, a little update with uh, the 3.1.1 version. And that is the one we usually see supported in our devices and our libraries, if not the version 5 that was released in 2019. Version 4 does not exist, or at least it kind of does, because in the header of the packet, they used version 4 when they were using 3.1.1. And that's why they skipped to version 5. Um, so what, what happens? There is a client, and this client can publish into a topic, and uh, another client or the same client can subscribe to a topic or several. And then the broker, which is the central server, uh, will relay messages uh, between clients. Uh, every message in this system has at least a topic and a payload, and this payload can be anything. It could be a binary file, it could be text, and most commonly used uh, is, is a text or JSON or just a number. Um, so if we visualize that, uh, we'll see uh, we have a broker in the middle, we have two clients, and if client one on the left publishes something to the topic room temperature, then the message gets sent to the broker and nothing happens. There is no subscription and the message is lost forever, asterisks, there is an exception and we'll come to that later. But First, we'll need some client to subscribe to the topic, and then if there is a publish on that same topic, the broker will relay the message and send the message to client two, 
who now gets the updated value. This also works with multiple clients, and note that the client number three uses a different topic than clients uh, two and four. So if client one now sends the updated room temperature, only clients two and four will receive this message. The topics are the addresses of the messages uh, in MQTT, and they're structured in a hierarchy, a bit like a file system with a slash as a separator. Um, in contrast to a file system, you don't start with the root uh, with a separator. Um, just remi remember that when you build this for yourself. You can use wildcards in the, in the topic names when subscribing, but only for a complete level or multiple levels. You cannot do character substitution. It's only for the whole part between the separator, between the slashes. And they are case sensitive, although some firmwares will actually uh, listen on uh, both the full caps, the non-caps, or the capitalized version of the same topic. Um, please don't put spaces in your topic names. That would be annoying and no weird characters. Just use common ASCII and you'll be fine. You could actually go and, and build a ginormous uh, a hierarchy for your house. Um, you could also make it very simple and just say, okay, I want sensors and I'll just number them one through three and, 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 and so on. And later on, we'll be talking about Tasmota and uh, there we'll see uh, Tasmota uh, already provides a default way of, of, of topics. Um, earlier I said a message was lost forever if uh, there was no subscription. Uh, but there was an asterisk, and the asterisk is a retained message. You can um, actually say, OK, I want this message to be remembered forever, or until I have a new message uh, flagged as retained. And this message will actually survive a reboot of the uh, broker. And if a new subscription is done to a topic, this message will immediately be sent to the client but you don't know from when this message was. So it could be a week old. Um, the quality of service we mentioned in the beginning uh, of the talk, um, the delivery guarantees. Uh, we have three levels. We have QoS zero, which is like rate zero, nothing, because there is no guarantee. It just tries once, and if the client receives it, it's sure, and if it doesn't, then not. Um, QoS 1 requires an acknowledgement from the client. Uh, this could also mean that uh, the message is sent three times, and then finally the acknowledge comes through, and the client has received the same message three times. If that is a toggle for a light switch, this is annoying. Um, so that's why you have QoS 2, which will make sure that the client only receives this message once and once only. Um, last will and testament is a method where you can, uh, while connecting, tell the broker, okay, if you lose connection with me, please inform others of my disappearance by sending this message to this topic. And that will enable you if at the other end of the pipeline, original uh, uh, development, uh, if at the other end of the pipeline the power is cut and the device disappears, but only transmits an update every five minutes. You don't have to wait five full minutes to notice it's gone. You get a response within uh, a couple of seconds because of the uh, keep alive to the, to the broker not being updated. And then the broker notifies the rest of the world, I lost a client. Maybe you want to do something about that. So let's see if we can uh, actually get this to work in a, in a live demo. I, I, I did try to uh, pray to the demo gods this morning. Um, pray with me. Um, what we can do is uh, simply uh, look at a, uh, a mosquito uh, subscription uh, command, which is, let's make it slightly larger, uh, is just subscribe to all the system uh, topics that the broker already provides. Um, the slash V in there is to actually get the topic names with them. So if I uh, run this uh, simple command, I get all my information from the broker. Um, these are all retained messages because I immediately get some data. Normally you only get when there's an update, but these are retained. Um, what we can also do is uh, actually say, okay, I want the broker information, but only the number of messages sent in the last five minutes or the messages received in the last five minutes. And uh, to demonstrate that, oh, wait, I have to type it correctly. Uh, the plus sign is the wildcard for a single level. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, which is move it up a bit, um, the received or sent differentiation is done in the uh, uh, second to last uh, 
uh, level of the topic, and I used a plus wildcard to uh, wildcard out that single level. Um, and I also have a retained message from last week, and I actually put it in last week, so it now tells the truth. Um, we can make it slightly more complicated, uh, but more fun if we have a publish command. A publish command is also uh, provided with, in this case, the Mosquito browser to uh, send messages. So if we start sending out some random data and then take another screen and uh, subscribe to, uh, wrong one, subscribe to our test, we actually see some random numbers. Um, we could also do this uh, with, of course, a Python script, because uh, there are libraries available for many uh, uh, languages, including Python, and with just a, a few lines of Python, we can actually uh, generate random numbers in uh, another topic. In this case, it's PyRandom, and we'll see that in a, in a later demo as well. And um, I'm running this as a live demo on, uh, in this case, a Raspberry Pi Zero in, in the little box on, uh, on, on the desk here. And that's basically all you need. Um, it, it could run on, on any OS. Uh, Linux is commonly used, but there are Windows implementations, uh, Mac OS. Um, you can run it on very uh, light hardware, like the Pi Zero I have over here. And um, this should not be any... Uh, 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 anything you, you need to invest in to get started. So um, I, I hope you start tomorrow when you're back at home or after teardown in a couple of days when you're back at home. And um, when you install Mosquito Broker, uh, keep in mind that it usually uh, defaults to only listening at local hosts. If you want to connect more devices to your broker, you need to add a listener in the config file to listen to all the devices. Um, this is the first Google action you do after installing it because it doesn't work, and then you get to this. And I had to put in allow anonymous because I'm not running any security, which you should because there is already a slight vulnerability in there. But now you have the MQTT broker. You need something to connect to the broker, and that is where um, I usually use uh, Tasmota, which is a universal firmware for ESP chips, like the one we saw in the Tuya light in the previous presentation. And um, this enables you to uh, control uh, any ESP over MQTT uh, via a web UI, over HTTP GET requests, or even over a serial connection, and it already has support for many, many peripherals you could hook up to your ESP. It's very configurable, and um, although it started out for a smart relay, a Sonoff relay, um, it is now uh, a huge library for uh, a lot of different devices, and um, you could probably have the ESP version of the Tuya Lite uh, in there with just a few clicks, which we will actually uh, try and, uh, and do. There are alternatives for this. You could use uh, ESP Home or ESP Easy uh, to, to get the same tasks done. Um, in this case, we'll just go for Tasmota. And what you usually do is you flash it, you set up the Wi-Fi, and then you over the air configure and update uh, uh, your devices. So um, if it's uh, uh, stuck behind a wall or somewhere high up in the ceiling in a light fixture, no worries, uh, uh, as most things can be done over the air. And the easiest way to install is the new web installer uh, using uh, web USB, just like the badge that you probably have already tried. Um, so if you have the correct browser for it that supports uh, web USB, you can just plug it in, go to the website, and say flash. It'll, it'll blink a few times, and then uh, it'll take you through the Wi-Fi configuration, and then you visit the device, and you're greeted with the standard Tesmota web UI. And from there is where the fun starts, because now we have a configuration button to actually uh, configure our device, and uh, this can be done with the, with the templates for all the common devices uh, that we already see. And in this template, you say, OK, I have this, for example, Sonoff uh, Smart Relay. And we define it has a button, it has a relay, and it has a, a status LED. And it's on these and these pins. The pins that are user-definable, which, uh, uh, which can be used by the user, and for the Sonoff, there's a few uh, pins, actually, a few IOs broken out on pins on the inside. Uh, you put them as user, and then when the user has selected the template and goes into the module configuration, you see the pins that were user-defined um, 
available to uh, uh, set up whatever you want. So if you would want to connect something extra to it, this is where you uh, uh, tap into. And um, of course, you have to also uh, set up the MQTT broker. And um, one thing I always do is I set the telemetry period from five minutes down to 15 seconds, because otherwise I have to wait too long when I'm tinkering. I don't have any patience. But with this set of tools, uh, we can build a lot of different setups. Uh, we, we can do things with uh, power monitoring, uh, environmental monitoring, uh, lights uh, with or without RGB. And uh, we'll try if we can uh, uh, do this for real now. So what I have here is an uh, ESP8266. Uh, uh, it also works on the ESP32, but this is what I had laying around. And it's in this little box here. Um, so it's uh, just this ESP, um, and the configuration starts out empty. There's nothing in there. So I wanted something. I added a shield with a temperature and humidity sensor, and all I have to do to get the data is just say, okay, I'll go to pin, uh, let's see, configuration, it's over there, module, pin D4, I want my AM2301 sensor. I click Save, wait for it to reboot, wait for it to reboot, and my temperature sensor is done. I can now put this on the field, and it's done. Thank you. <laughs> and if we look at the MQTT data, we actually see there is already a telemetry package coming down with the temperature of 22.8 degrees on stage. So this is how easy it is to get started with uh, your project. And if we want anything more from this, we could simply uh, add, add another thing, like a button. I have a shield for a button, so um, let me just go back to the browser and click on configuration again, add my button to the top pin button. This is button one. We actually have support for eight different buttons, so we could actually make a box with eight buttons, eight relays, uh, or, or any configuration between those. Um, now we don't see much. We, we need to, to put something in there to actually uh, show us the output. Let's add some RGB. I think that would be uh, fitting. I do not have this exact shield, but I have a, a little R RGB light in there, so if we go to the configuration uh, to D7, I can put in an RGB. LED or uh, a whole strip of LEDs. LEDs. You could actually have uh, a couple of meters of, of LED strip uh, connected up and make it do all, all, all kinds of rainbows. Once it's rebooted, we're actually greeted with a complete interface to turn on the, 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 the LED, make it shine, make it different colors. I hope you, you can see it uh, from the back of the room and on, uh, on camera. Uh, but we have full control over our RGB LED now. Uh, just by a few clicks. And obviously, we can control this through MQTT as well. If we want to add more, this is actually the full setup that is in, in the little box on, uh, on stage with me. Uh, I've added two more sensors, and I've added them uh, using uh, I2C bus. So we just go back into the configuration, go into the module, and for pins two, we have the data, and here is the clock. Click Save. Go to the main menu, and now we have all the sensor data we want. Uh, I'm running this off a power bank. Uh, I could now put this in the other tent, and uh, through Wi-Fi get all my data um, via the web interface or via the MQTT messages that come by every 15 seconds. There it is. Um, we added the button. I can click the button over here. I can uh, click the button on the uh, web page for toggle. Or I could send a message through MQTT. Um, we see the MQTT messages. And uh, they use topics, and these topics, and now I have to find the slide again. There we go. The topics are defined by Tasmota 
per default uh, with a prefix uh, that tells you what kind of uh, MQTT messages uh, uh, you'll be getting there and its own name, uh, which is tasmota underscore and the last part of the MAC address. Um, you could change this into anything you want, um, and if it is not uh, included in the firmware like you li uh, as you like it, you could actually build your own firmware because this is all open source now. Um, you can send the commands through MQTT, through the web interface, uh, through GET requests, through the serial console. You can string multiple commands together. Um, and, and there are a lot of commands. I mean, uh, I, I could make this slide uh, uh, 10 times bigger. You won't be able to read it, but, but please go to the documentation on Tasmota and you get the full list of the 150, 200 different commands. And, and we're not even touching on the scripting that is possible within Tasmota as well. Um, there's also very nice information when you're using uh, an ESP8266. Uh, which pins to not use, because there's a couple that are um, uh, high on boot or low on boot uh, uh, mandatory. Uh, so uh, if, if you do that, um, if, if you connect a button to the wrong pin, it'll boot loop. Um, but this enables you to get any smart socket, any smart light and uh, uh, with an ESP and uh, uh, run this firmware. Um, I've, I've, maybe someone saw this on Twitter once. Uh, I've, I've, took an, I've, I've taken a, a Blitzwolf smart socket and added a temperature sensor and um, that worked. But if we have measurements, if we have a smart socket, maybe with a built-in temperature sensor or not, we have to make a decision. At some point we want some part of our uh, MQTT network of devices to make decisions and have effect on another part, on another device. And that is where we actually come to uh, the last part, which is Node-RED. And Node-RED is a uh, event-based system of nodes. And these nodes created, uh, uh, connected together create a flow. Um, there are messages that go from node to node and they have, they have a payload and a topic, just like an MQTT message. It's not exactly MQTT, but it is close. Um, there are nodes that come with Node-RED. By default, there is a, a whole slew of more nodes available on the internet. Uh, they can be easily installed. And in this demo, we'll see, very short, but we'll see uh, a little dashboard node as well, uh, be installed separately. Um, and uh, version 3 was just released. Uh, the demo is still using uh, a version 2 uh, point something. Um, I, I didn't want to risk it two days in, uh, in before the, the talk to, uh, to upgrade. Um, so nodes and flows, um, that looks like this. Um, in this case, we have on the left uh, a MQTT input node. This listens to a topic. So it subscribes to a topic just like we did in the first uh, demo. And if a message is received, this will pass on the payload and the topic to the next node, which in this case is a switch node. It has one input and two outputs, and it'll check is the payload more or less than 50. And depending on that, I will set the payload from the value that came in to the word on or the word off. And if it's different than uh, the previous time that a message was received, it'll go through the filter node up to the MQTT output node, which just does a publish on uh, MQTT. And it actually sends it, in this case, to the power topic of uh, this ESP. Um, like I said, it flows are triggered because something happens at the beginning. So when this MQTT node here uh, gets a message, it'll start going through the flow. Um, but that means that only at that specific moment you have the payload available. What if I want to have a value from another device, from another MQTT message that came in just recently, and use that in a, uh, a decision I want to make now? What you could do is uh, use the flow or global variables to store some data. And you can do this with a, either a change node or a function node. In a function node, you can actually make your own JavaScript to create a complete program within one node. Um, so I think we'll just have to uh, look into it and uh, uh, try to uh, get the demo gods to cooperate one last time. Um, this is the Node-RED editor. And I'll just make this disappear with a little arrow. Um, this is the flow we just saw with the addition of two uh, nodes for the dashboard. 
Um, so we have a MQTT node that connects to my local node, uh, local host broker, and listens on Pi Random. We already saw the Pi Random because that is still running in the background, uh, spitting out numbers, and um, it passes on the number into this, uh, well, if then statement uh, in the switch node. So higher than 50, output one, otherwise output two. Uh, we set the payload to either the word on or the word off, and we'll send it off to the power of this LED. If I connect the last line over here and deploy my changes. Immediately the light turns on because the current value is higher than 50. And if we want to see that in the dashboard, we'll actually have to, well, I'll just type it in, it's probably faster. We can go to the dashboard and we actually see 61, 60, 61, which are the numbers we can also see over there. So now it is working, and if uh, the randomness would help and go below 50 right now, which it probably doesn't, um, I'll just restart it and hope it'll get, um, no, obviously not, it's the demo god. Yes, it's off. The light in front of me is now off. I hope you can all see it in the back as well. Um, and if it actually goes up above 50 again, the light will turn on again. There it is. So that works. Um, we can do uh, different uh, uh, flows as well. Uh, let's see if we can get over here. Yes. Um, the flow variables that we mentioned earlier are available within this tab in the, in the editor. A global variable is available on all the different flows, all the different tabs. Um, but here I have another one, and uh, what we have here is uh, the same MQTT topic with the random numbers, and um, the only thing it does is uh, uh, setting uh, the payload from uh, the message to uh, a local flow variable. So this is the mechanism to store the value for later use. I also plot it on the chart. Um, just to show you that if you want a, a fancy graph like this, it's very simple. You just drag in one node, give it a name or a title, and tell it I want 10 minutes or I want an hour or 24 hours, and you instantly get a nice graph. Um, if we want to use uh, this uh, information, uh, we can have a function node retrieving the same data. Um, you just call flow.get and the variable you stored earlier, and uh, there's your data. Um, this is a special node, uh, which is also at the top of the available nodes on the left, and this node can uh, be activated by pressing it, or you can tell it at the bottom of the screen there, it says you can uh, uh, put it onto an interval, uh, in this case, 21 seconds, so it just keeps repeating and repeating, uh, uh, triggering this single node, and um, what it could do is change the color of our uh, LED friend on, on stage here. Um, so what I did is I took the stored value, which is updated every 15 seconds, this injection node is running every 21 seconds, it gets the latest value it had, and just uh, calculates it, uh, divides it by nine, so it would get a, a, a number between one and 12, which is compatible with the color command in Tesmota, and that actually changes the color of my uh, LED. There's also a green node over here, which is uh, uh, very uh, uh, handy if you are uh, making something new. It's the debug node. If you look in the, side on the, the sidebar on the right, we can have a debug window, and as soon as this is triggered, we get updates of the payload visible on the right, so you can immediately see what data goes where. Uh, if I was curious what the injection node was sending out, I could just drag a line from over here to my node, deploy it, and now I have full visibility over what is actually going from node to node. 
Um, what we could do, what I don't have with me, but if you want to see this, uh, uh, find me later, uh, we could actually have uh, the result from the one ESP uh, set a command on a different ESP, so I could turn on a light based on what this ESP is doing. Um, and with that, um, I am through my demonstration, and it actually worked, thank God. If you want to know more. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to know more, there's uh, a lot of documentation available on the MQTT website, on the Tesmoto website, and on the Node-RED website. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention, and I would love to see what you are going to make with this. And um, if you tag me on Twitter, I, I will definitely uh, uh, look at it and, and, and like it and retweet it, and etc. And, and we have time for some questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions, come to these microphones in the middle. Um, also, I don't know if we have any messages over the internet. Uh, no? Okay. Um, yeah. We'll take this question. Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for uh, doing this speech. Uh, you are the one that taught me how to do MQTT. I was like expecting and talk about MQTT, but you did the whole shebang, <laughs> and it was like an epic talk. Thank you very much, man. Thank you, thank you. Because this is the man who said, you should do this as a talk. <laughs> so. Hello? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Thanks. Um, one question, if you have uh, lots of devices, like 50 devices plus, would, would you advise to um, set up a separate wireless LAN, or will it congest my, my normal wireless LAN? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, setting up a, a, a separate uh, AP might be a way. Uh, if you have a, an AP that uh, supports different S SSIDs on one access point, uh, that would be ideal, because then you don't uh, uh, pollute the, uh, the airways, but you still have the separation, and you could run them all in a separate VLAN. And if you have your broker uh, running on a machine that has uh, access to that VLAN, you could just route uh, the one port that you're using for your MQTT uh, on there. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, Thank you. If I understand correctly, you have one broker running on your Raspberry Pi and one Node-RED instance, right? Yeah. Okay. Can you uh, remotely access the Node-RED uh, instance as well? Um, if you uh, uh, have access to the Pi, then you can. Okay, um, so you need to you know, create your own access to it, basically. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it is all uh, uh, run locally, uh, so you are in full control. If you want to set it up uh, uh, to be accessed from outside, you could. Mm -hmm. um, if you want, to, uh, I personally use this only on my local network, and I can VPN in on my local network, and that way uh, is, is the easiest way to, to keep it safe. Um, but this is all locally running, uh, so there's no cloud involved, there's no uh, Tuya that, uh, that, that, that has some infrastructure. Okay, no. thanks. All right. Now we have, we have time for one more question, if anybody has it. And if not, uh, let's give another round of uh, applause for this presentation. Thank you.